it's always hard for me to know exactly how far we're going to get in the class discussion on the first night, so I'm going to pick up uh, where I think I would get done because I want to have these videos up available actually uh, before the class takes place. So hopefully I got to the right point and we're picking up in a logical sequence. Note that the slides are available on D2L so you can, uh, those of you that choose to treat this like a podcast and just listen to the audio, you can flip along with the slides. Those of you that are watching it, obviously you see the slides as we go. So we've talked about what is strategy and as a reminder, um, we're going to want to open when class begins next with this discussion of what did Porter think strategy was. And I introduced that article to you uh, at the end of class. So now that we've talked about generally what strategy is, <clears throat> how do you go about doing it? One of the things that I'm just going to be really honest with you about that I'm not real big on, but it's important to talk about it in a strategy class is this idea of mission, vision statements, and the like. And the reason I'm not real big on it is because of the first question. It says, how many of you know your company's vision or mission, mission statement? My guess is most of you probably don't. So then the question becomes, is that a big deal? Well, I think it sometimes is a big deal when the situation is right. Uh, let me give you an example of a company that probably doesn't matter what their vision or mission statement is. Coca-Cola. Coke has been around for, uh, what, probably over a hundred years, has done well in the past, pretty much intends to do well in the future, seems to be poised to do well in the future. So if they were to come up with this new vision statement or mission statement, would it matter to anybody? I don't think it would. Um, I'm going to show you a company I think it probably does matter for, and that's Yahoo. At the time I'm making this uh, particular video, Marissa Meyer has been the CEO of Yahoo a little bit over a year. And what I'm showing you on the slide is how the mission statement for Yahoo has evolved in the year that she's been at the helm. And is based on my recent check, pretty much what they've said in January is what they've stuck with, but notice July is what she inherited, and it talked about being a technology-powered media company. Then she shifted it, where they talked about being focused on creating deeply personal uh, digital experience. And notice that I've got underlined in that second bullet the science plus art plus scale. That was what the old leadership team was trying to sell. Notice it's there in the July. Uh, it says 2013 on the slide. That's an error. It's really all 2012. Um, and I'll fix that before I post the slides. And then you see it in August. Notice in January you don't see this science plus art plus scale. You see that she's changed to Yahoo's focused on making the world's daily habits more inspiring and entertaining. And then below that she's kept some of the wording. So this is where I think a mission and vision statement, and incidentally, uh, you can read a lot of textbooks that will write a lot about the difference between vision and mission, and I believe they are, there are differences, but in the real world, most people get them so confused, I'm not sure that it matters. Um, this is a sense of where Ms. Meyer sees the company needing to go. I think in this case, the vision mission statement does matter because people are trying to figure out where are we going. Any company that is in the midst of a turnaround or a startup, I think the vision and mission statement uh, can really be helpful. I also think when it's a tremendous step forward or it adds a lot of clarity, then it can be a value. Shepard Air Force Base about a year ago um, adopted a new statement that says train and inspire. If you know the mission up there, it has been for decades a training mission, but this idea of an inspiration that we inspire our airmen is new. I thought that was really a clever addition. Why don't these mission, mission statements tend to make a big difference? One, like I said, for Coke, they're long-standing companies that aren't in the midst of making any big changes, so people aren't looking for any particularly strong guidance. 
The other is they have a vision mission statement that seems to be roundly ignored by everybody. The vision mission statement is disconnected from reality. Uh, it's focused on the wrong things. Those are all ways where it can go astray. So I don't like to talk a lot about this concept, but I think it's a good way to get your juices thinking about how do I really do this strategy and strategic leadership thing. Uh, I love our textbook. Our textbook is outstanding. You will see me from time to time pulling material from other textbooks that I think have done better jobs explaining certain concepts. And this slide is an example of that. Our textbook tends to talk about st stakeholders in what I would call, they call the, uh, it's not as, they call it a symbiosis model where it's not a zero-sum game between the different stakeholder groups. Uh, I could kind of derisively call that the kumbaya model that we're all just going to get together and sing kumbaya and it's going to be good. Um, so what I want to do is add a little bit of clarity as to who stakeholders are and a lot of other people teach there are more identifiable groups. So stakeholders are people who are impacted by the firm in some way, shape, or form. And that can be a lot of people. It's not just shareholders, it's not just employees, and it's even not just customers, as you'll see. So one set of stakeholders in another book they call the capital market stakeholders. These are the people who own the company or who have a financial stake in the company. So these are where the shareholders go. Um, or uh, creditors and uh, those sorts of things. The next is the product market stakeholders. This is, are the customers, but also the suppliers, the community, that sort of thing. These are the people who do not have a financial stake in the company, do not work for the company, but are affected by the company. Not always will the interest of each of those little subgroups inside that stakeholder group align with one another. And then lastly, you have the organizational stakeholders. These are the, the managers and rank and file employees of the firm. And obviously they have a little bit different interest perhaps than say the consumers. Because I'm having to do this part of the lecture on the web, I'm not able to go to uh, the little links that you see on the slide if you do have the slides, uh, at some point I encourage you to just go to those links because what they do is they take you to a different set of slides. And my point in doing this is how firms are viewed as good and bad is often driven by the lens through which they're looking. Um, we won't have a chance to, to finish this off, the discussion we, we finished off in the class, I just had to roughly introduce it. Why do you think a company is great? Well, I think a company's great because it's a great company to work for. That would be like the Southwest Airlines model. Uh, if you look at Southwest Airlines as far as their uh, capital market stakeholders, they've done a great job of paying their debt. In terms of their stockholders, really not much going on for the stockholders. They've had very little uh, price change. Um, that, that it really doesn't even match the market. In fact, I didn't go back and check it for this period of time, but there's long periods of time in, in Southwest recent history where you'd have been better off buying a CD than in investing in Southwest stock. Then you've got which companies are, are widely respected and considered to be the best. Well, Apple would fit into that. And if you're an Apple shareholder between say 2008 and the fall of 2012, man, you did great as a capital market stakeholder. Since then, uh, not so much. And then you say, well, it's a great place to work. So it's, it's, it's great for employees. For the actual employees of, of Apple, probably true. Um, but remember, Apple outsources most of the construction of manufacturing and construction of the actual devices. So if you're working for Han Hai or Foxconn, as it's commonly known, in China, mm, Apple's not such a great company to work for. Now, that's by Western standards. By all the other manufacturers in China, it's probably just about as good <clears throat> as the rest. 
So what you want to see in this is, in the kumbaya world, well, if I do good by my employees, they'll do great products, and when we make great products, they'll sell really well, and the stock price will go up, so the capital market stakeholders will be happy, and oh, everybody's happy. And I agree, it, it can work that way. That just doesn't happen very often. And then, as Mr. or Ms. CEO, when those people are vocal, you may be forced to try to decide whose interests you have to satisfy. Here's an example. Apple, for a long time, well, as long as Steve Jobs owned the company, he didn't want to pay a dividend. Apple had literally hundreds of billions of dollars in cash. I think that's true, hundreds of billions of dollars in cash. In cash, when Steve Jobs passed away, no dividend. Capital market stakeholders, not real thrilled with that, even though obviously they'd done well with the stock price run up. So they wanted one thing, whereas if you're an employee for Apple, you kind of like all of that cash buffer because that guarantees you that there's going to be a lot of innovation. I've already hinted at this, are they mutually exclusive? Not necessarily, but probably even in the best of times they're not going to align perfectly and there's going to be times you're going to have to disappoint some and please others. And so how do you decide when to do that? This is something that just gets a very quick mention in the textbook, but I think it's an important way to sort through it because it's one of those frameworks that's going to help you understand what's going on in the real world and this idea of power, urgency, and legitimacy. <clears throat> As a CEO, you can figure out, frankly, who's going to cause you the most trouble when you look at how much power do they have, how much urgency do they have, and how much legitimacy do they have. The power is, is real clear. And this is, can they make you do things or can they hurt you? Who can hurt a company and a CEO? Well, customers could, can if they were to act in mass, if you have a diverse customer base. Stock analysts can hurt you. Activist shareholders can really hurt you. And this is a trend that we're going to see as we look at companies, how now people that own even relatively small blocks of the stock can really have an outsized impact on what companies choose to do because they're able to marshal some degree of power. So there's power, that's just the raw, I can make you do this because I got you. The next is this idea of urgency. The easiest way to explain this is sometimes we let sleeping dogs lie. Yes, a stakeholder group may have a lot of power. The shareholders typically always have a lot of power, but they may be happy. So they have no urgency. They're not upset about this issue. So urgency is like, oh, how, how passionate am I about this? And so if I have a lot of power, but I'm not passionate at all about the issue, then it's not something where I'm going to exert that power. Therefore, CEOs don't have to worry about me. The last thing is legitimacy. This is how an unpowerful group can gain power. Legitimacy says, to what extent is my position going to be supported by others? So this may be where a very small group with limited power is able to get other people to agree with their position or their viewpoint and marshal them such that they do have power. So again, as this video is made right now, there's uh, the Dell go private vote with the, sh with the shareholders is still pending. It may be solved, uh, it, will, it will be addressed very soon, whether it'll be finally addressed, who knows relatively small small blocks of voters are weighing each other to each side and you see Carl Icahn, the Raider, trying to get a lot of people to agree with him that the deal is underpriced. So you see people using their position trying to generate legitimacy so basically they'll go, come on, follow me. And then by assembling all these other groups you will gain power even though you didn't initially have it. This is something as a CEO you have to look at. So I think that's a very useful model. How powerful are they? How upset are they? How legitimate are their, are their positions likely to be seen? And can they bring other groups around to agree with them that have more power? 
So to sum up this introduction to strategy, what I want you to walk away with is this is a very dynamic, ongoing process. The first part of the, of the chapter points out so well that you're looking for a sustainable competitive advantage, and there really isn't today any better example of that than Nokia, how they went from being the top cell phone manufacturer to right now an afterthought, frankly, in just a few short years. Same thing with BlackBerry, went from they kind of displaced Nokia, and they were the darling cell phone company, and now they're up for sale. So it's a dynamic process of trying to gain a competitive advantage and keep it. Because the world is always changing, it's inevitable that you're going to make changes. Second, strategy is this idea of analysis, decisions, and actions. Or as Porter would say, and when you read the article, this is what you need to be focusing on, position, trade-off, fit, and we'll be talking about that. Actually, I'm going to want you to explain that to me uh, in class when we next meet. Stakeholders, these are the people that are going to be interested in what a company does. There are a lot of companies I'm not interested in what they do. I don't perceive myself as a stakeholder. Where there's others where I may own stock, I may love their product, I may have a family member that works for them, I'm very interested in what they do. And then just a little bit of a tease on this idea of a mission statement. And the reason I think that's going to come in is it's going to help us when we start to look at the firm in terms of uh, its external environment, its internal environment, and then the position it's adopting to try to go forward. I look forward to our discussion in class. I'll see you then.